everybody, it's Jude the Puppy Nanny. I'm here in Nanaimo at Dunbar Unleashed, and we've just had a marvelous day and a half with Dr. Ian Dunbar, and he has consented very kindly to taking a few moments uh, to talk to us about what he does and what he believes in terms of dog training. Thank you and welcome, Ian. My pleasure, welcome. Nice, so nice to have you and be here for my annual dose of Dunbar. <laughs> uh, you're a big proponent of lure reward training. Mm -hmm. Why? It's so quick. Um, it's the quickest way to put your behaviors on cue, like, you know, come, sit, down, roll over, heel. Um, and so it's really tailor-made for pet owners. That I, I think one of the things that a lot of trainers forget is that pet owners don't necessarily have the same skills uh, expertise or experience that the trainer has. So I always try and make training quick and easy. And you can't come up with a quicker method than lower reward training. And it's pretty easy. It's not the easiest, but it's pretty easy. Now how do those of us who believe exactly what you say and, to, and, and train that way, how do we continue to spread that word? Oh, by doing it, I think. I mean, there's, there's nothing like um, a good job done well, and not just you know holding puppy classes where we're lure reward training, but doing it properly. And I think the most important thing, you know, maybe where it's gone off track a little in the last 10, 15 years, is we're not phasing out the food. You know, we use food as a lure to teach the dog what we want them to do, and we use food as a reward because it's very convenient for pet owners who may not have the affect that we have. I mean, you're great on camera. You say, "Hello, there's a good puppy. Good dog." There's a lot of people can't do this, whereas you can say, good dog, and give them three treats, and the dog gets it. Oh, that's cool. Well, if I get three treats for peeing outside, then I'll pee outside. You know, I don't want to pee it indoor indoors. There's no fringe benefit. Right. So it, it's very convenient for owners, but ultimately then we want to phase out the food reward too and replace it with things which work much better with the puppy. Things the puppy wants to do, like play with other dogs, to walk and sniff, to jump up, to run away, to pull on leash, and all the things we'd normally call problems. To me, I call them rewards. Once you put them on cue, this is what the dog wants to do. Wonderful. That, that's, and it's a fun way to train too. Oh. I, I mean, yeah, of course training has to be fun. It's yes. like when I do my lectures, I mean, I could make it really boring, but then you're not going to, you know, transfer so much information. But if you get people laughing and giggling, we're not like this morning, we didn't have a break. I don't know whether you noticed. I certainly did. I just kept going and um, monitoring the people. They were all awake and they didn't really need it. And um, because the delivery is fun. And, and, and I think the other sides of fun, like I was saying in the seminar, when you play games with a dog, not only is it motivating and you'll get the best performances from the dog and the owner, but you also get compliance from the owner. They want to practice to play the game. And embedded in the game are skills like sit stays and, and following off leash. So they learn the obedience skills, but under the guise of a game, so they do lots of practice. But most importantly, I think, when you're playing a game, it allows us to quantify um, the, the dog's reliability or the control the owner has over the dog, you know, there's only one fastest recall, there's only one longest sit-stay. And so we can show owners what exactly is their level of control and how quickly are they improving as they train the dog. And that's really important that the owner is motivated on, mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And that's where numbers talk. Numbers talk. Yeah, yeah numbers is the yeah. proof. So with the lower reward, which is reward-based, is there any such thing as punishment? Um, well, now, no. One of the things I've been trying to do in the last three years is answer the question that what do we do when dogs don't do what we ask them to do, lack of compliance, or um, when the dog is misbehaving, he's forgotten his household manners. Um, is an aversive punishment necessary? And the answer now is no, we don't have to. That, but why people punish dogs, why they jerk them and shout at them and shock them, is we've actually removed words which have instructions and meaning from training of dogs and horses. When we bring in words, we don't need to be aversive and cause pain or fear because we can simply instruct and insist 
And that's what the dog learns. And it's the difference between, say, um, parents raising their children and grandparents raising the grandkids with the knowledge they've learned from screwing up their own kids. And so <laughs> parents are much more inclined to punish, whereas grandparents, like kindergarten teachers, mm -hmm. are calmer, mm -hmm. and they just say, right, let's sit down. And we're going to sit down. And then the teacher or the grandparent will say, well, I'm waiting. And when they sit, we'll say, well, let's do it again. That wasn't very good, was it? Stand up and let's sit down. Cool, okay, who wants ice cream? Right. Right, right, right. absolutely. And, and this, I think, is, you know, because I'm involved in dogs and, and other animals, but to me the application is in that interactions with people when, to me, the mere notion of an aversive punishment is horrible. It's not what I want to do with my kid. You're my wife. I don't want to do it. It's an anathema to me. But there are times when you, you have to fight for what you believe in, and, and I want my son to do this, or I'd like my wife to do this, and, but we're humans and we have brains and we have language, let's use it. And, and when we use it in teaching, it just goes along so much quicker and so much more enjoyable. For everybody. Yeah. Um, you use this a lot. You talk about what we all have voices and we can use them. They're, they tend to be with us all the time. So then there are many, many people who are very big on clicker training. So. What do you have to say to people about clicker training? Well, any training techniques has its pros and cons. Mm -hmm. So, um, and in, in this instance, you're asking what is the advantage of using a clicker? I mean, to me, there's other advantages of um, shaping and all and under reward training that we don't give the command beforehand. So, of course, that makes it a lengthier procedure, that's a con, but it makes it a more tranquil place See, if you don't ask the dog to sit, you just wait till he sits and reward him, then he can't be wrong. So the wonderful thing about a clicker class or all and under reward training class is the dog can't be wrong, so the owner doesn't get upset, so the dog doesn't get punished. But specifically, what are the pros and cons of the clicker? Well, the, the specific pro is timing. It's very precise. Click. You're marking that little behavior then that you want to reinforce, and the, the clicker, because it's click and treat, click and treat, so the clicker represents a treat and becomes a secondary reinforcer, instantly you reinforce that dog in that little moment of time. I personally am quicker with my voice than I am with my fingers, and so I just say, good boy, good boy, like that. What are the cons of it? For me, a massive one. It's removed the voice from training, and along with the voice, I think, the spirit and soul of training. I like to talk to my dogs. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm very precise and clear when I give instructions, I'll say, Hugo Louis sit, but in terms of consequential feedback, I like to chatter on and say, hot oh, damn, Hugo, man, that's one of the best sits I've ever seen you do since, I don't know, for the last three weeks. Yeah. Woo-hoo-hoo, yeah. Russian judge says 11, you know? <laughs> and it's sad that that joy as expressed through a voice and, and praise has been replaced by technical clicking. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not how I want to communicate with my dog or my child. Yeah. So it has significant advantages, but it ain't what I want. Yeah. I want to talk to my dog. And if you click, you just let the dog know this is right. Well, to me, there's more to training than that. I want to grade the dog. Mm -hmm. I want to grade my child. I mm -hmm. want to let the dog know not only you got it right, but how well you did. Like, thank you. Good dog. Mm -hmm. Good dog. Good dog and a treat. Yeah. Woo hoo hoo. Hot damn. Yeah. Three treats. Yeah. And so verbal feedback is instructive, mm -hmm. descriptive, and analog, whereas the clicker is quantum. Right. It's the same click, yeah. it's the same trick. Yes, the, the dog never gets any feedback as to whether he's improving. Yes, it's and like, it, it's well, it, it depends entirely on setting your criteria right. for little incremental steps in improvement. And does the dog meet this criterion at each step? Right. Then he gets clicked. But this, of course, is a very complicated technical process. And quite frankly, I, I don't think many pet dog owners are up to it, and I don't think many pet dog owners want it. Mm -hmm. I think what they want to do is to train their dog really quickly yeah. and to have fun doing yeah. it with lots of laughter. Yeah. I, I agree. I don't use clicker training because I say that I'm not coordinated enough to manage all this. So yeah. we don't, you, yeah. it's fine, you go ahead and use it, but not with me. Yeah. My, unlike you, my voice is quicker. Um, slightly different subject, because I work with puppies, um, I, 
I'm curious, is there such a thing, and I mean, I don't have a gazillion years experience, but is there such a thing as an aggressive puppy? Um, yes, 12 I mean, 14 I, I, weeks we're talking. Yeah, I, I would probably not use those terms because they're very woolly terms, mm -hmm. but do we get young puppies that bite? Yeah, they should all bite. If mm -hmm. a puppy isn't biting, it's a danger because the puppy biting is what teaches the puppies to be gentle with your jaws at a time when his, uh, his jaws are weak but his teeth are sharp, mm -hmm. so the dog learns to have soft jaws, dependable jaws, before he develops strong jaws of an adult dog. Mm -hmm. So if things that puppies do that we would consider um, annoying, the biting, or pushy, um, um, and this is all part and parcel of a puppy's personality, but the point is it can be changed. And a lot of people forget how malleable temperament and personality is in young puppies and in children. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, from watching, say, parents with children, it's like very early on they will make up their mind, like there's a little girl in the elevator today, and it's like, oh, you're shy. She, she went came, you know, coming in the elevator and I'm there, so she backs off. Total normal response. But no, this little girl's going to be shy probably till she's 16 because the mother's decided she's shy and That's keeps right. mentioning on it. That's right. And so we tend to fix yeah. early temperament as is and we now have the predisposition becomes the what we think it will be instead of saying you know that puppy took a long time to approach me so I'm going to sit here and feed him for a while and come back and retest him and son of a gun if now the second time we come in he doesn't run up like all the other puppies yeah. so the whole point is about temperament is it should be temperament training it should be personality adjustment and from an early age if you don't like it change it how do you want the dog to be? Right. More outgoing right. or less outgoing? Yes, yes, yes. And don't label it and thereby stick it once in that box. Once you wherever. label it, it's a great thing. And I've got an aggressive puppy. Yeah. Oh, well. That's yeah. And it's all too silly. I mean, what did this aggressive puppy do? Did he bark? Well, all puppies bark. Did he growl at you? Well, all puppies growl. Did he bite you? Well, we hope that all puppies bite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what yeah. did he do that makes you label him aggressive? And in reality, what he did represented 0.1% of his living time anyway, and out of that yeah, we brand yeah, him yeah. now as being aggressive. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's really good when you look at, say, adult biting dogs, they've probably bitten twice in their life, mm -hmm. and which was 0.00001% of their living time since yeah. birth, and because of that we call them aggressive. Yeah. No, for 99.99999% of the time, they've been beautiful. Mm -hmm. So we're so yeah. unrepresentative, I think, how we label behavior. We're big and label. on labeling. We're big on labeling. Yeah. But there's yeah. some people that only label. That's all they do. Right. You know, you have a problem with a dog, and you go and see some people, and they'll take a big case history, and at the end, they'll say, oh, yeah, he's uh, idiopathic aggression. Mm -hmm. Well, number one, that's a really dumb term. You know, I don't know what's causing it aggression. I get loads of I don't know what's causing it. Yeah. But the point is, you've done nothing to resolve it. The question is always to ask, how can I change this behavior? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, how can we change that behavior is where we need to go. If we have a puppy that has behavior that we don't like, it's not, let's not label it. Let's see how we can change it. Yeah, and the most important thing there is, I have a little maxim, if this is wrong, what is right? So if your dog does anything that bugs you, he's hyperactive, he barks a lot, or he's biting at your hands, then what does he do that you like? Not biting your hands, not being, so praise him at those times, but we don't. You see, we take the good behavior for granted, and we only pay attention to puppies and children yeah. when they misbehave. So if we reverse that and say, right, every five minutes, I'm gonna look at my child or my puppy, and ask, are they being good or bad? And if they're good, I'm going to say, you're doing a good job, I like this homework. Or, whoa, you're chewing on that con, eh? You're making a pretty good boy. You're being quiet and lying down and chewing on the con. Meaning, you're not chewing on the furniture, you're not barking, you're not running around like an idiot. Yeah. And that's how we change behavior. Yeah. That's how we change behavior, by representatively observing, classifying it as good or bad, and saying thank you to the dog when he's being good, which is 99.9% .9 of the time anyway. Excellent. Thank you so much, well, Thank Ian. you. It's Good always to see you again. Nice Good to, to see, see you again. We'll do it next time. We will indeed. Yep. Thank you. And thank you to you all. I hope you've learned something from uh, my chat with uh, Ian Dunbar. And for more information, he has a marvelous website called dogstardaily.com. Go there and you'll get a wealth of information. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Bye.